I'll give you a few moments, um, and as I give Holy Spirit a moment, I am not going to, I think I'm not going to give you a whole lot of scripture today. I think I want you to be, to know from the message title I'm giving you today is your true purpose in life. I want you to know that according to God. So my title is Determining Your True Purpose in Life According to God. I want you to know that. So I'm not going to, I'm going to try to avoid, I don't want to preach. I just want to teach. For those that are in this room, God has brought you in here for this message today. And for those that may be watching on YouTube, this is an important message. I think every pastor should teach this message. I think every congregation should hear this message. And once I finish it, if you agree with me, then I say to each of you, members of Guiding Light, you go forth and you tell others about this message. This is a message that the world needs to hear. This is a message that the church needs to hear. I'm going to go from a familiar scripture that we've been teaching on, and I've related and I've come to know, I've got the revelation that what God has been teaching me all throughout the years leading to a purpose of where we are now and what we're going to be in 2020 and where we're moving. God is revealing that to me now. And as I sit on the mountaintop, I can see, I can see the next horizon of where we're going. And I want you to be able to see it. So I'm going to try to bring you up to the mountain too. I know that's, 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 I'm speaking now inside. Let's go to Romans 8, 28. Let the Lord speak it for us. We're doing an exposition of these few verses here. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to make this meaningful to you. And I'm going to extract something from you. So, so from it so that you can see. So, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. We know this. Now watch, I'm going to read this one specifically according to the New King James Version. It's a little bit different to throw you. To those that are the called according to his purpose. That's just, that's just overly complex to me. To those that are the called, the specific, that, that, that word the. I didn't see that until this past week because I know it. I say to those who are called. How many of y'all have done it that way? To those who are called according to his purpose. But there's a word in there, to those who are the called. And this is the new King James. That just doesn't make any sense to me. But after I look at it, I begin to understand what God is saying there. And we'll talk about it later. And then he says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn, talking about Jesus, among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, that's going back to where he also said predestined in 29. He says, those he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And that sounds like a lot of rumbling going on here. But when you take it and break it down, there's a lot of meaning in these few verses right here. And these clauses... And he says, I'm going to read verse 30 again. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Now he's going to talk about those he called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Now he's going to talk about justified. And those whom he justified, these he also glorified. Now there's a lot of meaning in that. There's a lot of meaning. And I'm going to pull some of it a little bit out today and maybe more as we go on. And then he goes verse 31, which we jump to that relates to 28. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? I love this. I love Romans 8, 28 and verse 31. Like skip over the middle part because it's complicated, convoluted. But we're going to make it simple and I'm going to show you something hidden in verse 29 and 30 that we need to pull out. So let's just read 28 for a moment. This is what we can rejoice in. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. It's going to everything work out. We can rejoice in that. We can be glad that God's going to work it all out for us. 
Let's leave the other two verses out for a minute so we can go to the next happy shouting scripture. Verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Haven't we all used those? God going to work it out for me. It's going to be okay. Because if God is for me, who can be against me? Ain't that the way we do that? I ain't got to worry about nothing because God working everything out for my good. And if he's for me, if he's working it out for my good, who can be against me? Oh, we love to say that, but we miss the important part, which are two verses right in the middle there. We like to take out a context. He's going to work it out for my good. He's going to work it out for my good because if he's for me, who can be against me? All of us have done it. But what we're going to look at right here are those two verses where he says, verse 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. From that confirmation and conforming to the image of his son, I'm going to give you your first purpose according to God of why you are alive is that you are to be working on conforming to the image of his son. God has a plan for your life, yes, a purpose for your life to work everything out for your good, but it's in accordance to your living to conform to the image of his son. I need you to understand that. Too many Christians are not seeking to be conformed to the image of his son. There are many people that go to churches that are not seeking to be conformed to the image of Christ. They are seeking to get Christ to conform to what they want. As I said, this is a message that should be taught by every pastor. Because our churches are filled with people who call themselves Christians, who are living their life the way they want to live their life, without recognizing that it is God who has made them and not them making themselves. And then we have the audacity to say, God's going to work everything out for my good. And if he's for me, who can be against me? But that's not what God said. I ain't working it out for your good. I'm working it out for your good when you are conforming to the image of my son. then we draw men around us who will speak according to what we want to hear rather than what the truth of the word of God is. I can't live my life accommodating you. It ought to be abundantly clear to you that if I were to preach according to what people wanted, we'd have this church full. If I were to give you words telling you everything's going to be all right, God's going to work it all out for your good because God is for you. There's something in you that God is, that is calling you to. And, and, and all you got to do is just start doing what, you, what God has put on your heart. But see, that's partly true. Because most of us do what we want to do and say, thank you for giving it to me, God. We see cars that we like. And we decide, I'm going to buy that car. Never talk to God about it. We got houses. We got clothes. We got expenses that we get into all kinds of debt because we wanted it. And then we turn around. Well, God going to work it out some way. But God didn't tell you to buy that car. God didn't tell you to buy that house. You bought that because you want. God didn't tell you to marry that man. Didn't tell you to marry that woman. You married them because you said you were in love. If God were leading the lives of human beings now, we wouldn't have so many Christian marriages that are failing. Because what God had put together, no man. But we got folk getting married because they're in love because culture says be in love. That's all that matters. Love makes it right. No, we have twisted the word of God, and we go to pastors and tell them, as long as you're in love, remember, that's how my first screw up was. A priest told me, just make sure you're in love. One of the benefits you got with a pastor like me up here is that I have learned from listening to other people that people lie. Preachers will lie. 
when it comes down to what benefits a, a, a person's pocket, they make adjustments to what they got to say. If it's going to mean a little more money for me to say a certain thing to you, I'm going to say that to you. You know that's true. Many of you won't speak the word of truth for what you feel about your boss because you know that affects your money. A lot of y'all, the boss, and walked out, the, all, all, out your office, and you, that old, you don't know what you're talking about. But if you were to tell the truth, you know you'd lose your job, so you lie in front of your boss. You smile and grin. We have word. We call that kissing up. Well, there are preachers that kiss up, and there are friends that'll kiss up, but a true friend, according to the word of God, is one that's going to tell you the truth. And that's what real love is about. And that's the reason why we don't have an overflowing church. Because I'm going to still tell you the truth. I'm going to still speak out things that are wrong. And then you're going to say, well, how can you say certain things? Well, look, I made my mistake. I am not the one that wrote the book. If I wrote the book and do it wrong, that's one thing. But I didn't write the book. I got to line up with what the book says just like you got to line up with what the book says. Because I've had people that will challenge me and say, well, you can't preach because you do this, you do that. Don't nobody need to listen because you do Look, there has never been a perfect man to deliver the gospel of Jesus Christ except Christ himself. And if everybody were to shut up because they got problems in their life, then the message would never be heard. It's not my message, it's his message. So those of you that want to judge me understand, it ain't about me, it's about him. And he has called you and me to conform to his image. And maybe I'm not in his image yet. But like Paul said, not that I've attained it, but I press on to it. And that's all God expects every one of us to do. You might not be there now, but press on to the high calling of being the image of Christ. Look at his words, what he said right here. Verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, meaning he knew you before you came into the world, he predestined you. He has already set it up for you to be conformed. For you to be like Christ. That's the will of God. Let me prove that point from the very beginning. In Genesis 1.26, what does he say? The first thing that God says, Dorothy, where is she? You mean she ain't here again. Then God said, let us make man in our image and likeness. Why? Because man is supposed to be in the image and likeness of God. God wants you to act like him. He wants you to be like him. The reason why he gave you the Bible is so that you know how he is, so you strive to be like him. And as long as Adam and Eve were seeking to be in the image and likeness of God and not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, do their own thing, they had everything they wanted. See, Adam and Eve, when they were working to conform to the image and likeness of God, he was working everything out together for their good. When they went their own way, there was a whole lot of other stuff that got in the way because they went their own way. You know, a whole lot of other stuff is getting in your way because you're going your own way. You want to play with fire and then say, God, not going to let me get burnt. You want to pour gasoline all over yourself and smoke and then claim God going to work it out. He said, called according to his purpose. So what's the first purpose is that he wants us to be conformed to the image and likeness of his son. There it was here. He said, let us make man. The very first plan of God was for us to be in his image and likeness. Man screwed that up. But through Christ Jesus, the Bible says, as many as who have received him, he gave the right, the authority to become sons of God. Not born of the will of man or woman, but born of God. Born again to be conformed to the image of Christ. See, Jesus came into the world so that we would know how we ought to live. 
most of us are living the way we want to live. Jesus came so that we would have an example of how to live. I should aspire to be like Christ. It's not robbery. It is simply putting on the robe that God has given me. Did he not say, as many who have received him, he gave the right to become children of God? He's given me the right. Now what I've got to do is live my life and walk my walk knowing the goal that he has set before me. I'm to run this race where the end goal is to be like Jesus. Not to be like I want to be. I wanted to be a musician. I wanted to be in the business of music. But that was not God's plan for me. Many of you are running to do what you want to do. And you know why you run into so many troubles sometimes? Because you're like Paul, who was running against the will of God. Some of you are in hell today because you are running against what God's will is for your life. And you're in that hell saying, God going to work it out for me. Because God loves me. No, you forget, to those called according to his purpose. To the call. Yes, you've been called. But are you walking according to his purpose? You need to check yourself. Life is choice driven. You'll live or die by the choices you make. If you want God to work it out for you, you better make sure you're walking in the purpose he called you to. And that first major thing is to be conformed. Let's go back so you can see that. You can see it again. But see, the purpose was, now wait, wait. Now hold it right there because I'm going to show you something else. <clears throat> it's twofold purposes that God has for you. One is to be conformed to his image. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And then there's a second thing. Let them have dominion. Dominion is an action. To be able to have, have authority over something. That authority means the ability to command something to be, and it happens. But the preface of that is that first, they must be in my image and likeness. Then they can have dominion. So there's a twofold purpose I'm going to give you. One is to conform to the image and likeness of Christ. And the second, you can write it down, is this, is to do the works of Christ. Watch that, you'll see it. God has called you for you to be like Jesus. And then for, in this generation, you to do the works that Christ would do if he were right here now. I can load you with a lot of scriptures. You are the body of Christ. If you are the body of Christ and you see in this generation, you see the wickedness and sin that's in this generation. If you're the body of Christ, then you as the body of Christ would do what Christ would do when he saw it. But no, we as Christian folk are silent. And he said, son, man, I've made you a watchman that you are to warn the wicked. But what do we do? We are not living like Christ. We are not speaking up. We are not doing the work of Christ. So it's two things. One, I need to be conformed to the image of Christ. I need to be more like him. And then I need to do the works of Christ. Because Jesus said, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he shall also do. God expects me to be him in the earth. That's why he created me in his image and his likeness. He expects me to do his work. It's not me doing the work. It's him doing the work through me. When I learn how to get out the way, then the power of God begins to operate in me. Every preacher knows this. Preachers shouldn't preach from their intellect and from their intelligence. They should preach with the power of the Holy Ghost. 
It shouldn't be their words. It should be the words of the Holy Spirit that comes out of them. It's not them doing the work. They're just a vessel that God flows through. And that's what God wants every one of you to be, a vessel that he can flow through. All you got to do is say, Lord, I want to be like you. And if you will simply say that, he will start conforming you into the image of Christ. And as he conforms you into his image, he will empower you to do the works of Christ. Let's look at verse now 29. We say it again in two words. And we say verse eight, Romans 8, 29. For whom he foreknew, which meant he already knew you. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. He foreknew you. And he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the first thing, that he might be the firstborn of many brethren, that Jesus might be the firstborn of many brethren. God's plan is that there were many of us that would come after Jesus. But being like Jesus, a lot of folk, Come to church, and I ain't talking about being in church because there's a lot of hellious folk in the church. It's a lot of folks stirring up hell in the church. They're not conformed to the image of Christ. They are who they are. And when they're mad with somebody, they're rolling eyes in the church. They're not trying to conform to the image of Christ because if I conform to the image of Christ, I got to forgive you. And you know you a skunk. You know you nasty. You know you ain't nothing. And God telling me to be like Jesus, to give you the benefit of the doubt. You don't know what you're doing. Yes, hell, you do know what you're doing. You know you stepped on my foot. You know you mistreated me. You think I'm going to treat you right the way you treat me? But if I'm in the image of Christ, then I'm going to know that you might persecute me, but I'm still going to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Uh-uh, not Jim Lowe, but one conforming to the image of Christ will learn to forgive. Will learn to turn the other cheek. Too many folk in the other church ain't going to let nobody walk over them, because if you let them walk over you, they're going to keep on stepping. I got to let folk know how I feel because people ain't going to treat you right. You better tell them. And when they cussed at Jesus, when they spit on him, the Bible says he did not say a mumbling word. And that's, that's, that's the way we wrote it. We said that not one word. He said, but yet I could call 10,000 legions of angels. You got to understand that no matter what folk do to you, if you're conformed to the image of God, you don't mistreat nobody. But how many of us are ready to slap somebody down? Because if you don't tell them, these folk will walk all over you. I'm tired of folk messing over me. I don't know what they think. I ain't no carpet. Now, if I say something that are your words, ain't nobody told me you said it. Except the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit don't keep no secrets. To be conformed to the image of his son who did no wrong, who was tried and tested in everything, and yet he did not sin. I am to be walking every day trying to be more like Jesus. And I know you're going to tell me, you screwed up there. You didn't do that right. And that's the way the world is. But the Bible tells me there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So though I might get up and I might stumble, there is no condemnation coming from heaven on me. But you will cast it on me. You'll tell me about all my faults. But God will not condemn me because God sees me striving to be conformed to the image of his son. I don't owe you anything but to love you, no matter what you do to me. My job is to be conformed to the image of Christ. Every morning, I need to be, Lord, help me be more like Jesus today. And the devil who knows that we've been predestined to be conformed to his image is shooting every shot at us to get us to grieve the Holy Spirit by the actions that we take. 
He will throw lust in your eyes for all kinds of things, for you to get, get, get off base of conforming to the image of Christ. And Jesus takes it up to a level. He says, even if you look at one to lust after them, you've done wrong. So what the devil will do is bring all this lusty stuff in your face. And I ain't just talking about sexual lust. I'm talking about lust of stuff that you shouldn't have. He'll bring that alcohol in front of your face. He won't let you watch the football without telling you to get a beer. He will have it on television about how we need to legalize certain things because it helps people with pain. You know that? He's throwing it all in your face. We need to let folk love whoever they want to love. And so we let our children watch this on television to poison them so they cannot be conformed to the image of Christ. Who God, who is in Christ, said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, then say to his boyfriend, And the world will shout at you so you can't walk in the image of Christ. But if you walk in the image of Christ, you got to understand. You got to understand. The world won't love you for it. The world will hate you for it. And many people run away for it because they don't want the world to be against them. They kiss up to the world. I ain't kissing up to nobody. That's why we are where we are today. The bishop ain't kissing up to nobody. And we need more preachers who won't kiss up to money, who won't kiss up to congregation members that are paying the bills in the church. But every one of you all has been called to conform to his image. Every one of you has a purpose, and that is to be like Christ. That's what he says, predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And then as, as we look at it, let me just read a few other points that I'm supposed to make. There's something else I want you to know that you can rejoice in, and I'm coming back to that, that other point because it's something I want to throw in here. In this world, this is a blessing to you too. In this world, when you are working this, Romans 8, 28 through 31, you are going to encounter two types of situations and circumstances in your life. Two types. Summarize just two. There are situations and circumstances that you can do something about. You're going to encounter issues, circumstances, that you can do something about it. You can change it. And there are some things you can't do nothing about. Would you agree? And see, these scriptures, 828 through 31, affect that. And then we're going to read more about it later, but not today. When situations and circumstances that you can do something about, let me tell you what you need to do. First of all, you need to make sure that you're walking in your calling. That you are working. If I got a situation I can do something about, I need to make sure that what I'm about to do about it is what Christ would do about it. You know, I need some money. I know I can get some money. It's a member of my family that got some money under the mattress. They don't know how much money they got under there. I need some money so I can go get some of that money. But is that in accordance to the conf conforming to the image of Christ? I need to make sure I'm doing whatever I choose to do is going to be in accordance to what the will of God is in my life. So the first thing, whatever I'm going to do, I got to make sure I'm walking in my calling. Two, I got to seek the revelation of God. I need to ask God before I do anything, what is it that you want me to do? If it's something I can do, what should I do? When it comes to handling uh, uh, this building, I'm very prayerful. And very prayerful of the handling of this congregation. You see, everything's permissible 
but not everything is beneficial. So I need to seek God, make sure I'm walking in his image, and I need to seek God to find out what is beneficial so that I don't spend my time doing what is permissible. A lot of folk are trying to make a living. They're doing what's permissible, and they're running this rat race. They're running like a rat because they are not doing what they were called to do. And if they just do what God called them to, then they would find what they're running to do. They could speak to get happening. See, when you're called according to his purposes, there are certain things that come along with it. He said, you ain't got to climb certain mountains. Just tell that mountain to move. But when you're doing your own thing, you're going to have to climb that mountain. And you may never climb it because you weren't equipped to climb it. Some of you are doing things God didn't create you to do. And you're damaging your life. You are wasting years of your life when if you would just... Do what God told you to do. If you would seek his revelation, he would tell you how to solve this problem in a minute. Just like that, because he knows all the answers. When Joshua got ready to go into the promised land, wasn't nobody going to be able to bring down the walls of Jericho. But Joshua went and prayed to the Lord first. See, in situations of stuff you know that you can do something, go find out what God say do, and then go do it. And then once you've done all that God told you to do, just stand. Ain't nowhere in the Bible that God tell you not worry about it more. When you got a situation of something that you can do, seek the revelation of God. Make sure you're walking like you need to. One, seek the revelation of God. Find out what God tells you to do. Do it and then stand. And wait on the Lord. And be of good courage. Fret not because of evildoers. Just know that the scripture is true. If God is for you, who can be against you? That's in situations when you can do something. Well, what about situations when you can't do nothing about it? It's not in your control. First of all, make sure you're walking in your calling. Everything's going to start off with make sure I'm walking in my calling. See, I need to check myself first. Maybe this hell has come upon me because I done walked in it. You want to know sometime why you smell bad? Because you've been walking in it. And you're trying to figure out, I don't know why people don't like me. You stink. Because you're always into it. All the way up to your ankles. And you better watch the way you're walking in life. Sometimes people treat you the way they treat you is because you've been walking in some stuff you didn't need to be walking in. You think about that. Life is choice driven. Make sure you are walking in the calling God has called you to. Are you conforming to the image of Christ? Okay, I'm making it a little too, I'm getting too involved in there. Situations that are beyond your control, make sure I'm doing what God would have me to do. Second thing, seek his revelation. Lord, what is it? I don't know what I can do. Seek the revelation because God might tell you something you can do that you didn't know you could do. So in that situation, maybe God doesn't tell you anything to do. Again, if you don't know what to do, and wait on the Lord. Trust in the Lord and lean not to your own understanding and know those that wait on the Lord. They shall renew their strength. They shall mount up wings like eagles. Sometimes the mess you've been trying to get through, God didn't intend for you to walk through it. He intended for you to soar over it. You got to seek the revelation of God in every situation that you're in. Situations, then you know what to do. Make sure you know it's God's will for you to do what you can do. Situations when you can't do nothing, seek God's will. And if God doesn't tell you nothing to do, just stand. And the final analysis is stand. Trust in the Lord. Let not your hearts be troubled. And understand this. What you see is not what you're up against. 
there's stuff in this world that is not serious. You say, yes, it is. Yes, it is. You better learn how to stop seeing things in the natural and see things in the spirit because fear will come upon you about things you see with these eyes. You remember Elisha? And he had a servant. And that servant was out there, and he saw the armies of the enemy surround them. And it was hundreds of them. And he walked back into Elisha. He said, hey, master, oh, God, help us. Oh, we about to perish. We about to die. It's tons of folk out there, thousands of them. The man of God said, Lord, open his eyes. Some of y'all are in fear of the world. And you don't have your eyes open. And when God opened the eyes of the serv servant, he saw that there were tens of thousands of angels around that enemy. You got to recognize that when you're walking in the calling that God has called you to, the world's going to be against you. What you see with your eyes is, is going to be a challenge to you. But what you got to do is see with your spiritual eyes and know that when the world is against you, the world was against Moses. The, mo the world was against Abraham. It was against Isaac, against Jacob. It was against Joseph. It was against all the men and women of God. The world was against them. But see, when God was for them, Nothing the world tried to do could harm them. And you've got to understand, when you walk in your calling, the world will be against you, and it seems like there's nothing you can do, but keep your eyes fixed on the prize. Recognize it's Jesus that's going to see you through. You're going to die one day. Yes, these folk in this world can kill you. They can, they can take you out with a knife, with a gun, with poison. They can take you out. But guess what? God can raise you back up. Choose this day who you're going to serve. You got to conform to the image of Christ. So in a situation that you can do something about, make sure you seek the revelation of God. Make sure you're walking in your calling. And do what you, he tells you to do and then stand. Situations that are beyond your control, assure you're walking in your calling. Seek the revelation of God and then stand. And then let not your hearts be troubled. Fear not. Two words that are more in the Bible than any other words that are there. Fear not. Learn to see with a spiritual eye. And while you're standing, make sure you got the full armor of God on. Okay. I got a note that I'm going to put up here on the board for you to see, and I'm just going to continue to go through it. Uh, it should be everyone's primary mission in life to determine the purpose for which God has called them. That's what you should be living for. I'm telling you that first purpose is to be conformed to the image of Christ. To be conformed to the image of Christ. Get this understanding, y'all. He foreknew you and he predestined you. All of his word has been given for you to be like Jesus. And every one of you will say, how can I be like Jesus? Because God gave you the ability. He gave you his Holy Spirit. And if you will submit and walk in the spirit, you'll be like Christ. It is not impossible and to those who walk in conformity to the image of Christ, the power of God is released in them. So the first point, and put this one up there, my next bold statement, God has called you to become like Christ. That's what God has called you to. And everybody needs to know that. That's the reason you were born. You weren't born to be you. You were born so that you might be conformed. That's what Romans 8.29 said. To the image of Christ. To be conformed to Christ. I need to have it in my mind. I want to be more like Jesus. You need to have it in your mind. You need to be more like Jesus. 
The more you're like Jesus, the more God works everything out together for the good. But the more you're like you, the more you step in it. Because a man doesn't know what's right for him. Many have been walking around stepping in it all your life and wondering why you stink. Because when God has told you the right way, you don't want to be like him. You create more problems in your life because the, the way of the transgressor is hard. Second point, the two points here, God has called you to do the works of Christ in this generation. Now, not next week. If I'm walking in the image of Christ, trying to be conformed to his image, every opportunity that I have to love somebody that hates me is an opportunity I become more like Christ. The more I allow him to tame my tongue when I need to cuss your butt out, the more I become like Jesus. The work he wants me to do is the works of Christ in the earth. And there's a specific work he's called every one of us to do. That's different from everybody else. We are the body of Christ. You have a work of Christ to do. You have a work of Christ. You have a work of Christ. You have a work of Christ. Work of Christ. Work of Christ. Work of Christ. Everyone has a work of Christ to do. None of us are Christ that we can do all Christ could do. But every one of us can do a piece of what Christ could do. He's called you, called you, called you, called you, called everyone in this room to a specific work. In this generation, not tomorrow, then now God is not the God that is of tomorrow or yesterday. He says, I am the I am. You don't need to wait tomorrow to start doing the work of Christ. You need to today be doing what God has put on your heart to do. And maybe it's not the right thing. Maybe it's not where you're going to wind up. But start as you go along. You're faithful in a few things. Then he's going to give you more. You're letting your life pass you by. And you're missing the whole purpose of life. To be conformed to the image of Christ. And then to do the specific work he's called you to do. Everyone has a unique work that God wants you to do in the earth, in this generation. Now, you may have been doing something, and it may not be what God has called you to because you shut down what God's been saying to you because you don't want to do it. That was me. 20 years, I shut down what God called me to. Told me when I was six. This is what I want you to do. In 20 years, I said, no. And he told me, you'll never be happy till you do what I've created you to do. And I said, leave me alone. Let me live my own life. It's not the scriptures say that in Christ there's freedom. Get off my back. I don't want to preach. Some of you have roadblocks in there. God wants to do something with your life, but you keep to, uh-uh, that ain't me. Forgive your brother. That ain't me. Forgive your sister. That ain't me. You don't know what they did to me. <laughs> I'm going to go with what you just said because that's the truth thing. Matthew 16, 24. Say, if you're going to follow Christ, first thing you got to do. Thank you. Thank you. We don't want to die. I want everybody to know what I like. I like collard greens. You want to be my friend? Fix me some collard greens. <laughs> you know, uh, there's a lot of other stuff I like. I want y'all to know what I like. Because I want y'all to please me. But God didn't create me for you to please me. He said the greatest among you is going to be the greatest servant. I need to learn how to serve you, not tell you how to serve me. And most of us telling other folk what we want. Do this, do this, do this, do this for me. Give me this, give me that. Give me. That ain't what Christ did. Christ didn't come in and say, do this for me, do this for me. He came and showed his love. His love was that he washed his disciples' feet. I might hate you, 
But if I'm going to conform to the image of Christ, I'm going to deny myself all that hate. I can't stand your ugly guts. I don't care whether you light skin, brown skin, dark skin. I hate you. But if I'm going to be like Christ, I got to turn that hate. And I don't know how to do it. But here's how I do it. I can't do it. It's not me. It's more I let him cause me to conform to him. I'm going to love your stanky butt. And you ain't going to understand. Because God, his ways are not our ways. You'll wake up one day and I'll be so far removed from what you think I'm supposed to do. It's because I have been conforming to the image of Christ. And then I've started doing the specific work. The work I'm going to help you with a little bit later on. But right now, I just want you to get these two points in your mind so that you can get it. So that you can begin to understand. So I'm going to ask you this question. Are you maturing and becoming more like Christ each day? I'm asking you that. Do you think about that? Now, this is an honest question. <laughs> you need to ask yourself. Because I'm going to tell you, when you go home, you can lie up in here in front of all of us, and we might believe you. But a tree is known by the fruit it bears. I can ask you the question, are you becoming more like Christ every day? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. And then I look at you and I say, are you sure? What you mean am I sure? I know I'm becoming more like Christ. You don't know my life. How you get up in my life? How can you talk about me? And you got a, you got a, a beam in your eye talking about me. I'm becoming more like Christ every day. Jive turkey. What you, I know what you're thinking. But I'm going to be more like Christ. I'm going to learn to forgive you anyway. And that's the reason I didn't treat you with a long handled spoon. I don't want to have nothing to do with you. We have our ways. Don't you have certain folk that you can't conform to the image of Christ with? Be honest. There's some folk you just can't conform. They won't let you conform. <laughs> they won't let you treat them like Jesus should treat them. Can I get an amen? You know they're in your life. You trying to do right, but here they come. Oh, Lord Jesus. I'm trying to become more like Christ. And here this joker come. I tell you, praise God for the joker. Because the joker is your measuring stick. The joker has come to let you get a checkup. See, when the joker come, I can measure up to Christ or I can see how far I am from Christ. Hear that joker come. Whoa! But if I keep trying to conform, the joker come every day messing with me. But soon, if I keep trying to conform, I see the joker coming. He come. I ain't scared. How you doing, joker? What you mean how I'm doing? What you mean by that? Well, I really was just asking you, how you doing? I know your evil personality. I know you got something. You got you fixing to stab me in the back. No, I'm not going to stab you in the back, Joker. I might have done it yesterday, but today I'm trying to conform more to be like Christ. Now, don't push me too much because I'm close to the edge. I need the joker to help me know how far away I am from what forming the Christ is. So don't get mad with him. Praise God for him. So are you maturing and becoming like Christ every day? That's one way to find out. Go see that heathen that you can't, you can't stand. Then I ask you the other question, what is the condition of your inner man? You need to be honest about that. You know what's going on in your head. 
you know what's going on in your head. Remember, I'm trying to conform to the image of Christ. I need to be true to my own self. When I'm at home in the bed by myself, I need to purge those thoughts. I'm going to kill that joker. You just wait till tomorrow. I'm going to put some hot sauce in his coffee. I'm going to get him. I mean, ain't nobody going to know. All I got to know because his coffee be off to the side. All I got to do is go get some of that stuff. Get me some pepper and salt and stick it in there. I, I can't wait to see him drink it. You need to be honest and recognize all those evil thoughts are not of God. If you're going to conform to the image of Christ, you got to learn to love. That's enough for that. Let's just move on beyond that point. The primary purpose God has called you to is to be like Christ. Lock that in your head. Ain't but two points. I'm giving you a whole lot of subsets. <laughs> That's what the... Uh, uh, now, Ricky say about me, you know. Ricky say he got he got one he got two points, but each one of them got forty five sub points. <laughs> Sister Lester, no, she brought Ricky here one Sunday. I don't know, and he heard me preach, and I had one. I said I ain't got but two points, and he made fun of me ever since that. I never will forget it. I guess I could be mad with her because she brought him in the world. I never would have had to deal with that man talking about me like that if she had never had him. <laughs> and then she's still in the church, so I got to always remember that he done said something crazy about me. But that's what Ricky do all the time. He always say something crazy. You know, that's, she say all the time. <laughs> and nevertheless, <clears throat> primary purpose, God has called you is to become like Christ. Say that to your neighbor right now. Now make it personal on your own, and I want you to think it to yourself. You see, this is the reason God created you in his image, so that you could be like him. Jesus came and said that you could be like him. The second thing he said, and that he who believes in me can do the works that I do. So let's look at Romans 8.30 to take us for the second point. Romans 8.30, moreover, whom he predestined these he also called, called first to be conformed, secondly to do the work for this generation. Every one of you has a purpose for this generation, for the children of today, for the people that you see on your job. You have a mission, a message for them. The message of reconciliation, that God is reconciling the world to himself through Christ. You are now ambassadors for Christ. You have a purpose today to let the world see Jesus first in your conformity to him, see Jesus in you, and to see the works of Jesus coming forth out of you. It's not enough to be like him, just standing. You got to start doing the work. Doing the work in your giving. Doing the work in your sharing. With the words that you speak. Are you speaking the words of Christ or are you speaking the words of you? You must diminish and he must increase. It is a daily thing. It is take up your cross daily. Let me conform more to the image of Christ and let me do the work of Christ. What work? A specific anointing. He has said in Romans, in 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Let me check that out. Or is it 2 Corinthians? 1 Corinthians 12, 7. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. I'm conforming daily to the image of Christ. And Christ has given me a specific gift that he has that's in me. That gift is powerful in me. I may not be able to do what you can do because God gave you an anointing for a certain thing. He's given me an anointing for a certain thing. And in my anointing is where I shatter the yoke. In your anointing is where you shatter the yokes. 
if I try to walk in an anointing I don't have, it's going to kill me. It's going to stress me out. But what Christ has given me, it's easy for me to walk in it. If I'm conforming to his image, he says, for me, exhortation, preaching, teaching, that's an anointing for me. I can't do nothing. I can't put it. I can't, I can't even, I can't put two sticks together. My nails don't go straight. You know, I mean, my nail hammering and stuff. I, I, I didn't do well in shop when I was in school. I couldn't even play in a piece of wood. No, I couldn't. I mean, all the other brothers could be in there. They could play in some wood. It'd be so smooth. Maybe they don't even do that nowadays, okay. Well, there's other stuff I can't do. I can't play football. I can watch it. I only started watching it since I got a son-in-law in football, but I don't care nothing about it, though. You know, but I can play instruments, yeah. Thank you. But other people ain't got to do what God has gifted me, and, and, and you ain't got to do what God has gifted me, and I don't have to do what God has gifted you. What God has gifted you, can't nobody beat you at it. The reason you stress out is you're trying to be what you ain't. Find the anointing on your life. That anointing is going to come easy. It's going to flow because you were created for it. And walk in your own anointing. And in this church, we need to stop criticizing and condemning others because they don't walk in our anointing. She can't sing like I sang. Well, maybe, maybe she ain't got the anointing to sing, but maybe she got the administrative skills you ain't got. Every one of you has a purpose for everything. It's beautiful in its season. And in this season, this is what you do. You do this, you do this. Do what God has called you to do. And in doing what God has called you to do, can't nobody beat you at it. I got to conform to his image, find a specific calling, and walk in that specific calling. Now, how do I know it? That's what I'm going to help you learn. I know 2020 is going to be a year in which we're going to know all those things. Because let's look at the scripture here and take it on a little bit further here to show you that everybody got something. And one of the things, like I said a few minutes ago, we got to stop condemning other folk because they don't walk in an anointing. We understand. For at one time, all of us at a point, we didn't know how we're supposed to walk. If a person is walking in what they're not called to, they're stumbling. They're not any good at it. Yeah, you ain't called to it. We need to help them find out what they're called to and put them in the box of what they're called to, help them do what God's called them because that might be the blessing that we need one day. Stop criticizing one another. I don't know who my Joseph is in this congregation. You don't know who yours is. You don't know that one day somebody you rolled your eyes and he's got the anointing to cure cancer. They lay hands on them and they get healed. Now they might not be able to read a lick. They might not be intelligent as you is but they can cure cancer. You know, stop belittling yourself. Whatever gift God has given you is a great gift. Verse 8, he says, For the one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. Stop cussing folk out. Some of these folk might have the knowledge to know where you can get your next job. Some of them folk might be dumb as, as, as a, a, a Dora, but a, a doorknob, but they got a friend that's going to be the person you need to marry. That dumb doorknob might come in there with the person that might need to be your next husband, your next husband, uh, be your husband or your wife for every single person. Yeah, that's right. That's because you killed the first one, maybe. 
No, I didn't take no knife and kill him. You just, oh, Jesus. Oh, this is the big one, the big one. I didn't mean to go there, but that happens sometime, you know. Some of these marriages weren't made in heaven. They were made in hell. Now, don't, be careful now. Don't let it slip out your mind. I show enough. I know what you're talking about. Don't do that. Don't do that. You got to conform to the image of Christ and know that all things are possible. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. You're going to turn your marriage around. That's the attitude you need to have, okay? To another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same spirit. And then the next one is to another to another, the working of miracles, to another, pro see, God has given every one of us something different. To another, discerning the spirits, to another, different kind. And be watching those folk that always think they got a discerning the spirit. They done called everybody a demon. They ain't got no discernment of spirit. It's just easy. There's more demons out there. Say, that's a demon right there. That's a demon. That's a demon. Oh, that's God right there. You know, some folk that got, that got claiming they got an anointing, they got no anointing. There's some preachers ain't got no anointing. And, but folk believe them. Don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they're of God. And even when you feel like you got an anointing, test the doggone thing. Because if it's truth, you can't get nothing but truth. Do not be afraid to challenge your innermost thoughts. Men of God challenge God oftentimes to find out what the truth was. No matter, God's not bothered by you asking him a question. He's going to tell you the truth. To another different kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But watch this one thing that it says here. Verse 11, but one and the same spirit works in all these, distributing to each one individual as he wills. You don't like Minister Tangy? But God has distributed something to her as he put it in her. You don't like her, but God got something in her. And you don't know two, five, seven years from now that what's in her is going to be what you need for your life. Be careful how you treat her. Now, I'm just using her as an example. Brother Robert right here. You look at him, I can't stand him because he always saying, preach, bishop. Give me something, Bishop. Talk to him. I'm tired of him saying all that stuff in there. But you don't know there's an anointing on his life. Now, look, I'm going to tell you, there's an anointing on his life. Now, I may not know exactly what it is. I may have some idea, but there's an anointing on his life. And get this, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given. There's an anointing on her life. There's an anointing on her life. There's an anointing on your life, brother. There's an anointing on every person's life. It is your purpose to determine what is God called me to for this generation. Do you hear me? Okay, it's about time I'm trying to wind this up because I'm not, you know, this is gonna this is gonna be going on for some while till you get it and you've heard it in the message. You've heard something similar to this before. But everyone has a calling on their life. So let's go back and read verse 30. So we can see this purpose here. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Meaning, he got a plan, he has called you. What is that calling? That's that specific anointing for you to do in this generation. And in that specific anointing of what you do, he has justified you. Meaning, he has set you up that you can do and you can walk in it. I've been justified to be a preacher. I didn't want to do it, but y'all need to know, this is what I've been called to do. You know, I am doing what God called me to do. I know my purpose. I'm justified in it. You can talk about me all you want, but in the eyes of God, I've been justified in this because I'm doing what he called me to. And those whom he justified, he said he glorified. See, now there are weights for me just like Paul said. 
to be able to have to run as I have run this race. As I run this race, one day I'm going to finish the course. And when I finish the course, because I've been justified, because I've been walking in my calling, that I was predestined to be in, that God foreknew me and called me before the creation of the world to do what I'm doing now. When I meet up with him again, here it is. Before I was born, take it verse 29, watch it. Before I was born, he foreknew me. He foreknew me. He knew me before any of y'all ever thought about me. And then he formed me in my mother's womb. He had predestined me because he foreknew me. Jim's going to be a preacher. He's going to carry the gospel message to the generation that is going to be from the 1980s until he dies. That's exactly what I'm going to do. He knew that I would get lost in there because I would go my own way, but he had a plan that it was nothing I could do. And no devil, no demon in hell could stop me when I made up my mind I was going to do what God told me to do. And no angel either because my mama tried to tell me she said, I remember the other church, other house. I was downstairs. She said to me, you don't need to go into the ministry. And I told her, Mama, this ain't got nothing to do with what you think I need to do. This is what God told me. You know what my mama told me? She said, I just shut up talking to you then. I wasn't going to tell you nothing else. <laughs> You're going to go into the ministry. Go ahead and do it. Look at her nodding her head. She know that. She said, my mother, my mother kind of did one of these little numbers. She said, well, I ain't telling them nothing else then. <laughs> she left me alone and then there were still times when I was in ministry saying mama why you let me do this why you let me do this? <laughs> but he foreknew me he predestined me and he called me I want you to be that preacher I had to find that calling I went all kinds of ways but I found it and now I know what it is see he's justified me in it and even though folk talk about me say that preacher wrong he didn't say this wrong I've been justified by God and as long as I keep doing what God tells me to do, there's a point when I cross back over and I meet him in the future, but in his own now, I get glorified. Because I was trying to be conformed to the image of Christ as I walked in life, because I was trying to be conformed, God now changes me. I don't know what I shall be like, but I know this, I shall be like him because he will glorify me in the image of Christ, because that's when I walked in my life. Same thing true with you. Before you were born, he foreknew you, and he called you. Now, here you are at this generation. What has he called you to? Some of you are already walking in that direction. Some of you don't know it yet, but I'm going to help every one of you, because I believe it is the purpose of everyone that's been called to Christ, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, teachers, to help the saints determine what works of ministry they're to do. I'm going to help you do it. And God has told me how to arrange this church to get that to happen. And the way this is going to come about, God told me to get each of you now in 2020, and as we get to it, for you to become one person to seek out two other people or three other people who you're going to fellowship with. You're going to develop home churches we're fixing to create multiple churches out of this congregation. There will be a church that you're going to establish, that you're going to establish. And you're going to be the one that you're going to be. Now you say, but this ain't me. Hey, talk to me about it. I can't build no church. The anointing that's upon me, like priests, like people, people like priests, the anointing on me, look what guiding light became for every one of you. And people used to challenge me, you're trying to make everybody minister to church. You know what? Maybe it's true. Because every one of you have been called priest of God, a royal priesthood. Three other people. You don't know what you're going to do yet, but you're going to be seeking that. You're going to be praying for it. You get these two other folk right here. Y'all going to meet together. You're going to talk together. You're going to talk about the Lord. You, you, you never had a problem with prayer partners. I'm talking about fellowship partners. I'm talking about the 
divine potential partners. You're going to get with somebody that you're going, they're going to help you and you're going to help them develop your divine potential. You'll get with others. Three of you all. You're going to help each other develop your divine potential. What has God called us to? You'll talk about it. You'll discuss it. And then you'll reach out and you'll bring other folk in. You'll start being what God told you to be as an individual. Now, you may not know exactly what you're going to wind up, but you know what? You just start. You leave your country. Leave your, your family. And you leave your people and you go where God's going to take you. God's going to lead you. That's all I'm talking about. Do you, do you see? And you will find, Yvette, what it is God called you to do. You will not leave this world, Sister Broadneck, without knowing what God's called you to. I'm going to make sure I'm giving every one of you an opportunity. If it's the last thing I do, I'm going to put you in a place where you've got to seek out what does God want you to do in life. You know you got to conform to his image. But then you got to be more than just, just a person that's being caught up in yourself. You got to reach out to other folk. He said, go ye therefore, like it's going to happen. What happened happen with you? You're going to begin reaching other people and bringing them in to know the pains and hurts and the sorrows that you went through. You're going to be blessing other folk. And they're going to learn, she made it. And you're going to say, let me tell you how I made it. Every one of you is going to be a witness for Christ. Not just me from the pulpit, but every one of you. God has shown me to give you an opportunity. Other churches call them small groups. I'm talking about DP12 groups in which each one will seek to help others come to know what God created them for. To conform to his image, but what work do I do? You'll do the work in that small group.